Good morning. I'm Tom Brackett. I'm the president and uh, CEO of the New Jersey State Chamber of Commerce. And I want to welcome you to the first in a series of webinars that uh, we'll be discussing the status of women in the workplace in 2022. In early 2020, we began to tackle the issue of workplace sexual harassment. We work very closely with a nationally with, with nationally recognized leaders. Uh, basically, uh, your uh, co-moderator today, uh, Patricia Teppen Hart, when she was with the Council Against um, Sexual Abuse in uh, New Jersey, and she led our, uh, this uh, work with us. And we work closely with them to train our staff and to help us revise our event policies. We had plans to embark on a roadshow, taking this kind of uh, training and engagement around the state to different business groups uh, to begin to really aggressively attack this in the New Jersey business community. But unfortunately, COVID hit. And when COVID hit, a lot of our priorities were shifted. We had to pivot to the very rapidly changing business environment that was going on in New Jersey. But we haven't lost sight of the importance of this work and the leadership role that we want to take, ensuring that New Jersey provides a safe and equitable environment for everybody. Um, so thank you all for being here today. And we look forward to uh, this discussion and picking up where we left off in 2020. Before I get started, I want to remind everyone that today's webinar is being recorded and a replay will be made available early next week. Also, uh, after our panelists are done, there will be a Q&A session. If you wish, wish to ask a question, please uh, utilize the chat box. And now I'm gonna turn the virtual microphone over to our uh, co-moderators today, Anjali Kamlani from Yahoo Finance and ROI and J. And as I said, the Chamber Senior Vice President for Strategic Initiatives, Patricia Teppenhart. So ladies, take it away. Thank you, Tom, and welcome everybody. Um, as Tom mentioned, my name is Patricia Teppenhardt. I have the great pleasure of being the Senior Vice President for Strategic Initiatives here at the State Chamber of Commerce. And I come to this work also, as Tom mentioned, having served as the Executive Director for the New Jersey Coalition Against Sexual Assault for the previous seven and a half years. Um, my entire background is really based on um, gender equity. I started my career working with HIV positive women for a very small nonprofit in New Jersey, and then have worked for a variety of feminist and gender equity focused nonprofits through my career. I have the really good pleasure also of serving as a nominated member of the Governor's Advisory Council Against Sexual Violence. I was recently nominated and appointed to the advisory council about the status of women for the state of New Jersey. I haven't had a meeting with them yet. We're meeting next week, which I'm very excited about. Um, and I served with the previous Senate Majority Leader, Loretta Weinberg, on the work group against um, sexual harassment, misogyny, and assault in government and politics. And so when um, issues relating to workplace safety were really rising to the forefront of the narratives here in New Jersey, I had the opportunity to work with the Chamber of Commerce in my previous capacity to provide training and support to our staff and to our members and to work on policies that would keep our events safer. And I'm thrilled that now in my current capacity, I get to continue to lead these efforts um, and have an impact that I hope will be meaningful for all involved. So, I want to start before I introduce and, and turn the microphone over to Anjali Kamlani. I do want to let everyone know that we are aware of the fact that some of the conversations we may have, not just in today's discussion, but through the series of conversations we'll be having on these topics, could be triggering for folks. And um, we encourage you to reach out and um, seek support if necessary. Um, today's conversation is being recorded and it is open to the public. So as you feel comfortable um, sharing experiences that may have happened to you or people you love, be mindful that um, this is a, a conversation for public consumption. And if at any point in time you feel like you need support um, during or after this conversation, um, New Jersey has a wonderful resource. It's a statewide sexual assault hotline. And um, my colleague, Chris Lewicki, will put the phone number in the chat box, but it's one 800 6017200 and you can reach a, a free confidential sexual violence advocate 24 hours a day if this conversation brings anything um, to the forefront for you. Um, so now I'm going to introduce and give the floor to my 
colleague and moderator today, Anjali Kamlani, if you want to introduce yourself to our guests. Thanks, Patricia. Yeah, um, some of you may already know me. And for those of you who don't, my name is Anjali Kimlani. I am the senior health reporter at Yahoo Finance. I previously was a reporter in New Jersey, so I know the lay of the land pretty well. I uh, worked there for a little over four years, I believe, um, it, in the most recent past in the capacity of a business reporter, first with NJBiz and then with the lovely startup RYNJ, which is going on a number of years now, actually. So for those of you who aren't familiar, tune in. Um, I had the pleasure of covering a variety of beats a while in New Jersey, starting off at local papers, uh, specifically in Atlantic City, uh, about a decade ago now. Yikes, I'm old. And then I... <laughs> moved on to covering politics and healthcare and moved really into the business sector uh, in 2015. And that was uh, eye-opening for me. Uh, it's really a different world and paying attention to sort of the needs of people, but in a different capacity was really interesting for me. And I had many experiences, some unfortunate and some fortunate, both being a woman and a woman of color in a very diverse state. And I think this is a really important discussion uh, just based on everything that I've ever seen or experienced. So thank you so much, Patricia, and to the chamber for the experience and the opportunity. No, thank you for continuing to keep New Jersey moving forward. We know that we don't have the pleasure of being with you full time anymore, but we really appreciate that you come back um, and continue doing help us engage in meaningful conversations. So we're going to start this conversation with sort of an overview of where we've been. So as Tom mentioned, we had started these conversations, particularly around workplace safety and workplace sexual harassment back in 2020. But the chamber actually in 2016 had released a workplace culture survey. And so I'm going to just very quickly share with our audience some of the data that came out of that well, maybe I'm not because I can't find it in my, oh, here we go. I'm sorry. Here we go. Okay. Can everybody see? Okay. So we would have done in 2021 a, an updated version of this survey, but again, COVID sort of rose to prominence. And so here we are in 2022. Everything is just a little delayed right now. So we asked respondents um, whether they thought their organizations or businesses should be doing more to increase gender diversity. And 25.4% of women who responded to the survey said yes, and only 12.29% of male, male respondents said yes. 75.6% of the women surveyed said women and men have the same opportunities. I'm mean, sorry, the men surveyed said women have the same opportunities to advance. It only 55% of women leaders said they felt they had the same opportunity to advance as male colleagues. And when it comes to the types of gender diversity initiatives that exist at work, 61% of men surveyed said that their company has mentoring programs for women. Yet interestingly enough, only 37% of women who responded said their company has programs for women. And then the final piece that we'll share is that 61.5% of men said that there were no significant obstacles to overcome when implementing gender diversity programs, but women shared that they felt um, that there are only 44% of women showed that they thought there were no obstacles. And so what I, we thought it was important to highlight that because that data is very consistent with data that I found in my previous position. So while I was with the New Jersey Coalition Against Sexual Assault, we launched a statewide confidential survey to try to gather data specifically around misogyny and harassment for women involved in government and politics. And it's been well reported on about the prevalence of this issue. There are still so many stories left to be told. But what is very interesting is the consistency in which men and women um, have very different perspectives about the prominence of the issue. So in the report that NJ Casa issued, 13% of male respondents said that they believed that misogyny was extremely prevalent, prevalent in the realm of government and politics compared to 46% of female respondents. And then similarly, as we talked about sexual harassment, 11% of men 
perceived it to be something that was extremely prevalent compared to 30% of women. And so the reason why we need to share this data and share these gendered perspectives is because we want to center the lived experiences of the people who are being most impacted by these cultural norms and these inequities. And so when we can really understand how women are perceiving the issues, then ideally we can come together to create workplace responses that will address those gaps and build greater, greater spaces for safety and equity. So in one minute, we're going to bring our panelists into the room, but we also wanna know who's in the room with us today besides Anjali, myself, and our four amazing panelists. So I'm going to launch a poll and ask you all one question. We wanna know who signed up to be here today and with which gender you identify. And this data is very important to us as well as we think about building out this series of conversations moving forward and think about our marketing and who needs to hear the conversations that we're having and who's organically interested in them. It's also very important that we don't make assumptions based off of names on registrations. And so I really appreciate you all answering these questions for us. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll and share the results. So as you can see, 87% of our attendees today identify as a woman, 13% identify as a man. And so we will use this data to inform our conversations moving forward. Um, and as we round out our conversations, we will also think about, you know, what do we need our male colleagues to bear witness to as we really attempt to center women's voices? So I'm gonna turn it over to Anjali as she welcomes our panelists into our conversation today. Thanks Patricia, yeah, and I wanna follow up on that point too. It's really important to note that at a forum geared towards conversations about women, women are attending. Maybe it's just going to be one of those things where it's just cathartic, but we're going to get to, we're going to get through all of it. Um, I'm, as you already know me, I'm going to just start off by calling the names of our panelists and then they'll ind individually be able to introduce themselves. First, welcoming to the panel, Shirley. Thank you, Anjali. Hi, everyone. My name is Shirley Emahelu. I'm a partner at Kiza Shahinian and Gian Tomasi, recently rebranded as CSG Law, which is surely much easier to say. Um, at CSG, I am chair of their Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. Um, I am also a practicing attorney. Um, I am co-chair or co-lead of the Banking Finance Group on the litigation side. My practice primarily centers on white collar defense, government investigations, commercial litigation, and other uh, financial fraud controversies. I'm a former federal prosecutor, having uh, served as a prosecutor at the U.S. Attorney's Office in Newark for nine years. For my last two years, I was chief of asset forfeiture and anti-money laundering, and I started my legal career at a large New York, New York law firm um, as a litigation associate. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here, and I look forward to hearing from everyone's perspectives, and I'm sure we have a lot of uh, shared experiences. Thank you. Hey, I bet. Thanks, Shirley. Next, I'm going to call on Kim. Sure. Good morning. Uh, my name is Kim Verheilig. I am the Vice President of the Buildings and Places Business Line for AECOM in New York Metro. Um, as a licensed architect, I lead a group of about 200 architects, building engineers, interior designers, landscape architects, and urban planners. Um, we have offices both in New York and New Jersey. We work across a range of markets from education, transportation, federal, corporate, commercial. Um, I also sit uh, on the New Jersey State Board of Architects. And um, while I'm, I'm excited to be part of this conversation, and while I'm proud to say that my team is very diverse, as a firm and a design industry, we continue to struggle with equity and leadership positions. So I'm, I'm really excited to hear some of the thoughts today. Same, we're all glad you're here. Eileen. Hi, my name is Eileen Delaval, and thank you for 
having me on the panel today. And I want to thank my colleagues that all showed up in that 100 people over there. So thank you for that. Um, I work for KS Engineers. I'm the Vice President of Business Development. And I work in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. We're actually the largest minority-owned engineering firm in the region. Um, I also sit on the boards. I just want to give you a little diverse. I sit on the boards of WTS, uh, WTS, the Women's Build Council, and Society of Marketing Professionals and their DEI chair. So I have some other perspectives. As Kim said, in our industry, we have some work to do. Thank you. Excellent. And last but not least, Marcella. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here with this great panel of speakers and with our co-hosts. Um, my name is Marcella Maziars. I am the Vice President for Community and Government Affairs for Thomas Edison State University. Previously, I was at the New Jersey Department of Health. I was the Deputy Commissioner for Health Systems. Um, was in that role when the pandemic started in 2020 and had 22 months of um, responding to this unknown virus that came and has changed our lives forever. Um, so I have a lot of stories of what, how we responded to that and how difficult it was for women. Um, and I look forward to sharing with this panel uh, and their experiences. Absolutely, and we look forward to hearing it. Marcel, thanks so much. Patricia, back to you. Well, welcome everyone. And I am very excited to dig into this conversation. I'm very thankful that you've all agreed to participate in today's discussion. We're gonna start by, you know, I, I presented some of the data about where we were in 2016 and what respondents across the business community shared. And I just wanted to get a sense of where do you think we are today? Does that data still resonate? Have we made progress? Did we make progress and then slip back because of COVID? And I'd love to hear your thoughts. You were selected for this panel because of your history working particularly in male, historically male dominated fields and industries. And so I'd love to hear how you think all of this plays out now in 2022. And I'm happy to have you all. If someone is feeling the burning need to take the lead on answering this first, you can just feel free to jump right in. Kim, I'm going to kick it to you. <laughs> okay. No one wanted to be the first one. <laughs> uh, well, you know, the interesting thing is when I, I heard the results, to me, they weren't they weren't surprising, right? I think it's it's uh, who shoes you walk in in a firm, and sometimes you don't realize with, with if you're not in that position what someone else is going through um, or the struggles that they're facing, right? So I think communication and daylighting this is the best thing we can do. Um, so that we, we actually can move the needle somewhere. I do believe um, the, the one point I thought was interesting, right, is that more women are gonna be in senior leadership roles in the future. And I do think that's, that's gonna happen, it has to happen. Um, I just don't know if five years it's gonna happen, right? And I think that that's part of what this conversation is today, right? Until there, there's that uh, generational change at the top. Um, and I think there's a, a generation that's not yet ready to give up the reins and trust it to the next generation. But until that happens, I'm afraid the cross section is gonna kind of look the way it does today, which is you know, a little scary. Excellent points. Anyone want to chime in on that? I'll just tag on the... Uh, Kim's comments. I think part of, I agree with Kim, but I also think that we're seeing leadership changes in the government where we're seeing more women running agencies like the DOT in New Jersey, you know, different places like that. And women, they're saying, you know, when you go to see a client, they want you to reflect who they look like when you go to a presentation. And our male colleagues are going to have to understand you want to win a project, you can have the great technical proposal. Right, but you have to have relationships. That's really what brings you over the line. And we have similarities. So I think that people need to get it that everyone needs to be at the table. Frankly, regardless of gender and color, everyone needs to be there. I would just add, uh, I guess law is a little bit different in the sense that we see a lot of parity in law school and um, in the early years of uh, law firm careers. Um, in terms of gender. So, and if, in fact, I think women may make up now a greater percentage of uh, law school student bodies. Um, but what then we see is through attrition, um, women sort of basically exiting 
um, especially law firms, um, as they advance in their careers. And um, with respect to your, your note regarding the pandemic, Patricia, I would say that what we're seeing is that the pandemic may have accelerated that attrition because so often um, women are bearing the brunt of caregiving responsibilities, um, supervising remote schooling. I think we all grew to appreciate teachers infinitely more um, during this pandemic. I'm fortunate to have older kids who required less supervision, but I know friends and colleagues with young kids, it was very um, difficult being their supervisor, if you will, while also trying to juggle one's um, career responsibilities. Um, so it's, it's a little bit different, but also a lot of shared experiences, particularly for women who are um, becoming more senior in their roles. Agreed with you, Shirley. And I think that um, as we were responding to the pandemic, of course, in the Department of Health, we have a great leader that is a woman, Judy Percy Kelly, the Commissioner of Health. Um, and sitting at the table at the Department of Health, uh, most of the individuals that were deputy commissioners and at the higher levels in the department were all women. But then we would talk to the CEOs of the hospitals in the state of New Jersey. Um, my branch, uh, I used to be in charge of all of the licensing of healthcare facilities in the state with over 4,000 health, healthcare facilities when you start adding substance abuse and mental health facilities. Um, of the 71 actual acute general hospitals that are licensed, only a handful of women are CEOs of these hospitals. So it was a very different conversation when we were having it with uh, the women in leadership at the Department of Health and then bringing in those CEOs. There was um, a lot of them that are uh, white males that have been in charge of these uh, hospitals for a long time. And only recently have we seen some changes and more women become CEOs. As far as the um, higher education, there was a recent, just this week, a recent poll that came out, an investigation from the College and University Professional Association for Human Resources that showed that um, institutions with female senior faculty and top administrators earn more at institutions with female precedents. And we're lucky at Thomas Edison University to have a female president, um, Dr. Meredith Hancock. Um, but we're still seeing that there is a gap between what women earn in higher education, as you could see in every industry, um, with what men um, earn in higher education. I know Anjali's gonna jump in, but I wanna just tie that into Elizabeth Ackerman made a good comment that I actually think speaks to Marcella's point there. Um, Elizabeth wrote in the chat box that, it, that it, it's also cultural that women may now be able to compete in the same arena, but until we can inform the rules, we won't be equal. And I think that's a very telling data point that you just gave us Marcella, that when women are in leadership, women through all ranks of an organization benefit financially and from opportunities to lead. And so thanks for bringing that into the conversation. And to that point really about, uh, you know, the, the costs and the, the salaries, et cetera, and, and all of that. I think that um, Marcella, to your point though, the handful, I think we can both agree is actually generous um, in counting the female CEOs of hospital systems. Um, and that's actually naturally, which is where I wanna go with this, just for a second to like pull ourselves back because in New Jersey, we tend to focus on ourselves just a little too much sometimes. But uh, looking at it broadly, just trying to lighten the mood here, guys, looking at it broadly, uh, nationally speaking, how do you think we fare compared to other states um, and the country as a whole when it comes to that, when it comes to the cost of living, when it comes comes to uh, salaries, when it comes to really just uh, even race related uh, issues, just how do we fare, do you think? Um, and how do we stand up? I'll start off with Marcella. And I think that it, it definitely what we've seen is the um, magnifying of those uh, disparate conditions that we see in our state where we have uh, systems of care that are enormous, uh, uh, with the latest technology, but we still see those that have and have not as far as receiving care. Um, and we saw a big impact um, depending on your zip code, depending on the city that you were, of the care that you would get. Um, and that has been magnified by the pandemic. And what you see is that 
a lot of our direct care providers are women and they are now exiting the workplace in massive numbers what has created is what has created a crisis in our direct caregivers in nursing um, home health aides cert certified nurse aides um, where women could not do homeschooling and also be present at their jobs where daycare issues are now exacerbated because everybody had to stay home. Um, and so there was no way for, uh, for the women to come out and be able to do their jobs. And that has pushed them out of the industry. And in New Jersey, I believe with our, um, you know, with, this is a great place to live, but having a um, higher, uh, uh, taxes and expenses also makes it um, harder for that dollar that a woman may make be, uh, compared to a man. Uh, we still have white women that are making at 90% or 80% of what a man earns to a dollar. Um, when you speak about a black woman, that goes down to 70 or 60 and a Hispanic woman, it goes even lower to 50 or 45 cents on the dollar. So um, I think that it, you see that exacerbation of um, those disparities. And it's not just because of your gender, but also your ethnicity and your cultural background. And I know we could dig down even further and kind of find some of the reasons why, you know, some of these things happen, why the job distribution happens as it is across uh, race and gender, but we don't have time for that today. So, uh, Shirley, your, your response. Yeah, I think it's extremely challenging um, for female attorneys who want to rise the ranks and maybe become a partner or other senior um take on a senior role at their firm because of the cost of living is so high and um, the proximity to New York as well. And so, um, you know, what I've observed is women who are able to move up the ranks, they often have strong support networks. Maybe their spouse is stay at home. In my situation, my husband is also a law firm partner in New York. So that's always been a challenge. Um, Childcare is extraordinarily expensive property taxes are very high. And so that's always been a challenge. A large part of our income goes, historically went to childcare, property taxes, which support our, our public schools, which our children attend. Um, but that's always been sort of a, a point of discussion <laughs> between my husband and I is, you know, kind of when we each kind of go more hardcore in our respective, at our respective jobs having worked in government service, certainly the pay is less, you do at certain times have more flexibility, but um, this whole notion of like Cadillac benefits for federal employees really is false. And so um, I was actually fortunate to have my kids while I was at a law firm and that law firm in New York had very generous um, maternity leave and parental leave policies. But then I saw my friends when I was at the U.S. Attorney's Office who had to cobble together any type of um, extended parental leave and um, especially a paid portion of parental leave. So I think there's so much more work to be done in terms of, um, you know, pay equity, um, child care um, support, um, because, of course, those child care providers themselves are living in an expensive state and they have their own um, household expenses and that they can't just take on a job that's not going to um, be able to support them. So it, it is very difficult. Um, so it is a cost benefit analysis. I mean, I still love living in Northern New Jersey. I love the proximity to New York. I love all the cultural opportunities and the diversity that my entire family and my kids have been able to enjoy. But that pull to, to lower cost areas is definitely there. <laughs> You're definitely scratching the surface of that, um, you know, of the design of how jobs employers work and, and how that distributes really across, you know, gender and to that point about being close to New York and the, uh, you know, the, the, the culture that's, of, of course, been on hold for the last two years, but uh, hopefully that resumes pretty soon uh, and full fledged. Eileen. Well, you're talking about across the country, and I'm very thankful that Governor Murphy signed a law where you're no longer to allowed to ask people how much they make when you go to a new position. So you be, should be getting a salary based on your qualifications. And I think 
part of our job is to educate more people that that is the law in the state of New Jersey. So, you know, I work in engineering and a woman who comes in should be paid her, for her qualifications regardless of her gender. If she has a PE, she should start at a certain level. That's it. And I think that we need to educate, um, you know, like I guess people in my our industry that they need to think about those things when they go and ask for a job. So I'm really thankful that we have that law of protection in the state of New Jersey. That's a really good point. And I think it goes back to something that, um, you know, I've always said, which is we should all just be treated as human beings. Our experiences should speak for themselves. It doesn't matter what our race or gender is. Kim. Yeah, and I think, you know, we talk about whether it's a New Jersey or a national issue from a similar to what Shirley's saying from an architect's perspective, right? I sit on the National Council of Architecture Registration Boards. There's a tremendous amount of women entering architecture school, but we are not seeing women get to the top of the profession. And it's really because you have to go to school for five years and you have to mentor for three years. And then you're only just beginning to be eligible for your exam, right? So if you're starting to think about a family, all those things get in the way. Um, so I will say there is a national conversation happening now in, in trying to allow that mentorship part to overlap the education part while you're in college so that there are more options for women and it doesn't become the part where you have to choose, do I have a child, do I sit for the exam? Or now that I have a family, how do I carve out that time? Because if you're not getting the license, you're not getting the pay increase and you're not moving up the ladder. And that's incredibly important. And it's very hard to do when you're later in your career. So then let's pivot to another reason why sometimes women are leaving the workforce or transitioning out of careers or job hopping. And it's another category that I want us to be able to at least skin the surface on today. And that's the prevalence of like gender bias and misogyny and even the prevalence of sexual harassment in the workplace. And we know when women are not at the top and the person at the top is a man, it's very hard for women to come forward and disclose things that have happened to them in the workplace if the culture is one that has accepted, like, well, this is just what it's like to be an engineer. You're working with a bunch of men, you have to deal with it. Or if you're working in politics, that's what it's like in politics, you have to deal with it. And we all know good men in our networks who should be held up as the standard bearers to shift those cultural norms, but even they sometimes feel pressure about whether or not they're gonna speak up or speak out or hold their male colleagues accountable. So I'd like to have a conversation about, again, to your comfort level and for anyone who may be feeling like they wanna to contribute to the conversation in the chat box, being mindful that these are public conversations and we're not intending to um, you know, facilitate any type of disclosures or outing of bad actors. However, we know when we had a prep call and we talked candidly as women behind the scenes in a non-recorded conversation about instances of misogyny or harassment happening to us and impacting our careers. So let's have a conversation about that. And, and I'll start it very generally so that you can respond in a way that may meet your comfort level. Have you or anyone you know experienced misogyny or harassment through your course of work because that's another reason why women do not intend to climb the ladder because to get there requires enduring a lot of trauma and pain um, really based off of our gender identity. So I'm gonna open it to Marcella first. Absolutely, um, I definitely have experienced that. I've experienced uh, the comments uh, when even in an interview, knowing that these are things that you can't ask of someone that is coming in on an interview. Uh, well, you had your first kid. How many more are you going to have? Um, or, or individuals saying, oh, my God, weren't you just pregnant? Um, I have two kids. Uh, they're five years apart. So you know, these are very aggressive comments to be making coming from a, from a men saying like, well, uh, you're not what we need because we don't know how many more kids you're going to have. And that's obviously against the law, but doesn't stop it from happening. Um, and I think that we're privileged to work in a place where I was in the Senate majority office um, and work with Senator Weinberg to strengthen the law against discrimination for pregnant women, um, to actually put them in in the category uh, uh, that is protected. But 
even with that, you know, it, it, it's hard for, for younger women that are in their childbearing age to try to move up and change jobs when those are the questions that you're being asked by a, a prospective employer. Yeah, who else wants to chime in on that one? No one wants to touch it? <laughs> well, it looks like Eileen's going to jump in, but I, I'll defer and then no, I can make some comments no. afterwards. But No, I'm going to wait on you. You go first. Well, I was just going to say the law. I mean, because we're lawyers, I think we just tend to be much more careful. So I think yeah. what we see more often in the legal field is more like microaggressions or just sort of structural impediments, right? So um, in your sort of traditional, and, and I'd, I have not found that to be the case at, at CSG, but in sort of your more traditional, maybe white shoe law firms, you have the model of business development, you know, on the golf course. And it just happens to be, you know, some, some women play golf, but um, for many of us, until maybe later in our careers, we don't necessarily have the privilege to spend entire days on the golf course honing our, our game and so that we feel comfortable going out with colleagues and prospective clients. So oftentimes it tends to be men and they're forging those relationships. And so I, I think that ha can be challenging or even just the, the, the presumption that that's sort of how you make connections and build your book of business. So um, I would say that it's more about microaggressions in law as opposed to, thank goodness, compared to decades ago, you know, things like Justice Ginsburg talked about when she was breaking into uh, the legal field. Um, it's, it's not as overt, if you will, but it's still a challenge, you know, whether you go in the courtroom and you're mistaken for a paralegal or a court reporter, you know, that sort of thing, it, it definitely wears on your self-esteem. And, you know, certainly as a woman and a woman of color, I've always felt a need to not just prepare and be as good, but actually to perform a hundred plus percent um, better than, than my peers, um, because there is sometimes that assumption that you may be less than. So I think that's sort of the, the challenge that's faced in the, in the legal field oftentimes. Yeah, and I and I, you know, I'll just add my own lived experience to this. I was interviewing very long, long time ago for a job, and a two men owned a communications firm, and I had met them through like a leadership development program, and they were interested in bringing me on to staff. I met them after work for drinks to talk about what it might look like, and the question to me was, you know, that a lot of our business deals are made over drinks after work, and we know you have a young child. How are you going to do that? And I'm like what am I doing here right now? And, and of course, I just walked away from the opportunity to further right. engage in the conversation because that really set the stage for what that workplace culture would be. But how many times do we have to walk away or how many times do we have to just sort of eat it because we really want that gig or need that gig? And that's really complicated. Sorry to interject. I just was feeling a certain thing. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to tag in here. Um, so you all need to learn how to play golf everyone on here, regardless of your age. And there's lots of groups where you can go play golf before you go out with the other people in your firm. And WTS is one, WBC and SMPS. Some of those groups have just clinics just for women to learn how to play golf. So when somebody says to you, do you wanna go and be part of their person? You have to say yes. And one of those people is on this call today and she's gonna put something in the chat, I'm sure. But it's, you have to be there. You have to play with the boys. Um, it is what it is. We just have to get through some of it sometimes. Um, so thank you for the golf part because I wouldn't have been able to do that without your leading. I appreciate that. Um, the other thing we were going to talk about is we're talking a little bit about the microaggressions and people don't realize, I think sometimes what that also includes is not being included on the email, not being included in the meeting. My favorite part is when people don't get any of those things and then they get asked to actually do the work. Um, so I think that we need to, you know, some of us have our own little networks and support systems, and you have to figure out how to make, make that change in your company if that happens for you. And to, you know, sometimes it's you standing up for yourself. Sometimes you need to get someone in your firm to speak for you. And that took me a long time to be okay with in my career, because some of you know me and some of you don't, but I'm very, um, this is what you get and there's no sugar. So you, sometimes you have to learn how to make the system work for you. 
um, to be able to elevate yourself to the top so you can make a difference for someone else. And also making sure that you bring a woman to the table when there's an extra chair or make a seat for someone else besides yourself to bring another woman to the table. So thank you. Kim, did you have a thought or? Yeah, I think, I, I mean, I, I kind of agree with what every, everything that's been said. Um, I think as Shirley said, for on the design and engineering side, we it's more than microaggressions. And I agree with what Eileen says. It, you have to find a way to kind of nicely let somebody know what they're doing is making you feel a certain way, right? Because a lot of times they just don't really know that they're doing it, right? I mean, granted, some people absolutely know they're doing it. Right? That's a different story. Um, but in my experience, you know, I try to look for people that also do it to my staff um, and try to call them out on the side and say, hey, you know, you should have copied that person. You should have included them in the conversation. I mean, I think it's all about kind of communicating that and hoping um, that they're gonna learn because if you don't say anything, it, it doesn't get any better. The one other thing I will say is the worst um, kind of overt harassment I've gotten is actually from clients, which is a very tricky situation, right? Like that's an even harder thing to deal with, right? Because internally we do a really good job at educating our team and letting them know what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. But when you cross into that boundary, it's hard. Um, and Marcella, you, what you said actually brought something up I, I had forgotten. I was in a client interview once with three of my partners who were male. And the question they asked me during Q&A was, if, if we award you this project, are you going to get pregnant? And I thought, mm -hmm. are you kidding me? What about these guys? What if, what if they're going to have children? Yeah. <laughs> right? Absolutely. So that's, that's really tough. Um, but in some respects, I had a good relationship with my partners, and they understood that that was completely inappropriate and how I would feel. Um, but, but those things happen, you know? It's they true. Should. That's a really good point. And I think Laura made a comment um, in the chat that women shouldn't have to adjust to meet the typical norm. And that kind of touches on what I wanted to say since we're all just sharing here, I'll share too. Um, I think that that's really how I've felt about it and how I've addressed it. And of course I have had my share of experiences where I am treated differently or I uh, I have a plethora of uh, you know experiences of microaggressions that I could share. But I think the one thing that I've always held to and has helped me in case this is helpful for anyone else is sticking to that idea that um, I just need to be my most authentic self. And that includes, for example, and this is going to shock some of you, but uh, cursing when I'm talking in front of CEOs. I have done that. And uh, it's just because it's so easy, like it's so common for me to do that. I didn't even think twice. And after it was out of my mouth, I was like, oh, I just dropped an F-bomb in front of so-and-so. That's Let's see how that plays out. So, you know, stuff like that um, is, is stuff, maybe maybe it's just, uh, maybe it's considered inappropriate, but talking about things that you think is going to be uncomfortable from them, you'll be surprised actually how many engage and, and drop that barrier or drop that bar that you feel like you're facing. It's surprisingly a good tactic and uh, giving away my secret. That's what I do all the time. My whole goal is you're a human being and I'm a human being. We should be able to just communicate as professionals. Yes, I could drink you under the table basically, but I don't have to do that. I, my liver is kind of important. So I shouldn't have to <laughs> give up on that. Thanks for the laugh, guys. Um, but <laughs> but moving on from, from this, the microaggression part and kind of on this thread, like, has anyone done anything or experienced something that was surprising to them? So for example, I've had some really strong uh, older white male allies um, in newsrooms or in you know the workplace. Uh, my workplace is really just everywhere, right? As a journalist, I have sources or I have places that I constantly visit, people that I constantly talk to uh, back in the day in Trenton or otherwise. And it, it surprised me sort of the level of allyship that I received once I opened that door. So uh, I'll start off with you, Shirley, just any experience at all or any ideas that you have that you want to share? Yeah, I would absolutely agree. I mean, I would say many of my sponsors and um, I, I differentiate sponsor between a, a mentor, sponsors, someone who kind of does something affirmatively to help you advance, um, not just sort of counseling you and, and guiding you, but is actually out there pitching you. Many of my sponsors do not look like me. They they are, are men. They, they're not um, necessarily a person of color. Um, 
And I think oftentimes the way you establish those relationships certainly is, is showing, you know, interest in that person, what they're into. But I think oftentimes you achieve it first through a level of mutual respect. And that means putting forth your best work, right? So, you know, you can do all the sort of networking and, and shindigging you want, but if your platform, right, if, if what your, your brand is, is not a brand or reputation of being an excellent attorney, excellent engineer, an excellent um, a university administrator, um, that's going to, you know, hinder you in terms of forging those relationships. But when that sponsor looks at you, it's like, you know, I can recommend Kim, I can recommend Marcel, I can recommend Eileen for any number of things. And I'm willing to put my name behind that recommendation. Um, that's, that's what you want, right? Um, so I think you have to approach those relationships um, without necessarily the assumption that because that person doesn't look like me, we can't, um, we can't, you know, forge um, a relationship. Um, but oftentimes, yeah, there could be barriers to even initiating that relationship. Um, if, you know, that person, you know, maybe comes to the relationship with certain biases. But um, I think, you know, if you can forge that those similarities, and sometimes it's not golf, I love all the talk of golf. Um, I've started taking golf lessons, I'm decent. There are a lot of men who are terrible. I saw that in the chat too. So don't be afraid to get out there. Um, but you also have to be yourself. And I saw that in the chat too. If golf is not your thing, don't fake it till you make it because, you know, that's okay. You know, there are lots of men you surprised or, or you know, women, non, non-binary who love other things. You know, a lot of folks now are into whether it's Peloton or hiking or their dogs or, you know, fill in the blank. There are lots of other um, points at which you can forge these relationships. So. And Shirley, going back to what you said about uh, forging those relationships with those around, you never know who your next ally could be, right? And there's a lot of folks that they may not look like you, but they have fought in their careers uh, hard um, to make sure that there's justice and equity in everywhere that they work. Um, and I think that uh, you could definitely find that. But being yourself, uh, you know, I, I think that that will speak and your work product will speak for your for you and you could find those uh, uh, not just mentor, but a group of allies that are always looking out for what are we doing purposely and, and to always think purposely at how is every decision that I'm making, especially if I am higher up in the chain of command of any group or organization. What am I doing that could potentially be affecting others and keeping them down? How do I intentionally think about breaking any of these uh, disparate treatment and systemic uh, issues that are embedded in all of our institutions? Um, and how can I purposely think of making sure that those that don't have a voice um, are allowed to have a voice in the space that I'm occupying? No, if, if I can, Sharon? oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. You go. I was just going to say um, to the point of, I actually forgot my point. So go ahead, Patricia. I'm sorry, <laughs> okay. you can totally interrupt me. I'll jump in when I'm ready. <laughs> okay. So what, what I, I wanted us to get to some conversations around the impact of COVID, but I feel like you expertly wove some of that into the front end of the conversation. And I feel like there's a point that I, I want to make sure we hit on here. And it's about the, the level of comfort and familiarity we even all had with each other when we got on a call to prepare for this discussion, right? So, like I had the great privilege of knowing each of you, but you didn't all know each other. And yet we came to a conversation with a real level of vulnerability because A, there was a high level of comfort in the content we were gonna be covering as panelists and moderators, and also this idea of shared experiences. But what I, what I struggle with a little bit is the need for women to mentor women and the need for women to create space for more women at the table. But while men are still predominantly in leadership roles, 
And Marcella, as you're talking about, when we move into leadership to create space and reach down and, and identify opportunities to break down barriers and create more equity, the problem is that men are talking to men and women are talking to women, then who is mentoring the men to be better leaders when it comes to identifying and creating spaces that are more equitable for women? And so, you know, one of the questions that we asked in that survey back in 2016 that is actually replicated in the survey we're going to be releasing in 2022 is talking about what kind of gender equity things you have within your organization. And so I'd like to challenge those who are on the call. And again, we saw the demographics and so we know we don't have a number of, a great number of male attendees, but the data is important and this conversation is important. We need to think more intentionally about A, good men mentoring good men. And we need to think about creating cross-gender opportunities for strong women to be mentors to men who were growing up in our career spaces. Because when you talk to men as they grow up, they often say, I admire my mom. I admire a teacher. We know that teachers are still predominantly, that profession is still predominantly dominated by people who identify as female. But yet in the workspace, we kind of create this weird binary discordant track where like women mentor women, men don't get any mentoring. They just learn by harmful cultural norms that have been perpetuated and historically upkept. And so anyway, I'm just verbal dumping like an issue that I hope that we can tackle. Anjali, I know you found your point. And so let's get into it. I did because I saw in one of the comments, just like, you know, uh, comments about what, what experiences people have had. And I want to point out because someone else just pointed out right now, and it's true, it, women and women is also an issue, right? I have had an experience where a woman who was in charge of a place that I worked had some pretty nasty things to say about me and some pretty judgmental things to say about me and the way that I work and, and. I think that that was really shocking and kind of opened my eyes to the reality of my situation, which was I had an older white man being my ally and an older white woman being absolutely the worst to me behind my back, mostly too, and, and saying things to people that weren't very helpful uh, for, you know, just general brand recognition. So it's interesting to me because I know that we sort of in trying to support women and trying to create this conversation, we don't address also that sometimes we don't support each other and that right. goes across races too. So I think that's a very important point that we need to uh, keep in mind as well. But yeah, to, you know, to what you were asking, just how do we make this conversation a, a whole human conversation versus just binary or just d disparate in the way that it currently is? And, and I'll let whoever wants to answer first. And Angeli, to add to that, I think that it's important for some for individuals to understand that they have some privilege, right? So as a white woman that is, uh, for example, uh, higher up in an organization, there is privilege that comes with being a white woman in a certain position that is not uh, the same for other women that may be in your organization, in particular, if, if they are women of color. Um, so I think that that intentionality of always be of uh, making sure that as you're dealing with your organizational structure and um, the the work that you're doing, I mean, of course, uh, you have a privilege, but you may also need to look a little bit deeper and see, understand what that human being that is working with you is going through. If you're a white woman that has no children, but then you're working with uh, individuals that may be single mothers um, that don't have the same resources, you know, your conversation with them shouldn't be, well, go hire a babysitter full time like I do, so I don't have to worry about being at work. Well, you don't know if that person could afford that or if culturally for them it's acceptable to have a babysitter. Uh, but how do we make it work so that you could do your best work without, um, you know, having these uh, stresses put on your family, um, in particular when you're a, a sole caregiver? Um, so I just think that if you really intentionally look at those conversations um, and, and uh, you'll find that it'll be easier for you to relate uh, to others and to really understand where they're coming from and be helpful to them rather than continue to perpetuate that system of putting them down and not letting them advance. Thank you. 
Anyone else? I'm going to say, I'm just going to jump in um, with your question. Sometimes it's not going to be a formal policy or program in a company. Not everyone has those kind of, uh, unfortunately don't have them or depending on the size of the firm. So I think some of us, I could say for myself, have these relationships. So I have some young men that I work with in, my, in the company I work for that I have a, um, a mentoring relationship with. And I actually have some men in my company who I would consider a, either a sponsor or a mentor. Um, I'd have to say that those are men of color for myself that are helping me. Um, but I think it's all the way around. And even when we're talking about um, not having formal programs, how we're communicating with people or spending time with people to make people comfortable to open up to say what they have to say, I think is important too. And in the middle of COVID, what I was doing was taking walks with people. I didn't want to be in your office with you, um, but I would take a walk with a colleague or a you know, potential client, frankly. And a lot of that became a lot more intimate and we could have conversations around not just a project that we should be doing together, but what was going on in their lives, how they were doing things. And honestly, I got to give a lot of, I hope it was good advice to some um, younger men, but I think that we need to think about how we're, initiating those relationships and you have to keep those relationships fresh. You can't just go to someone to say, I don't like how you're doing that or you could be doing it this way. It actually has to be a real relationship. And I think we need to think about those things too. And uh, women who do not support women are the worst. And what was Madame Albright had a saying for that? And they're the worst. And I am gonna give you a piece of advice. Sometimes you can't fix it. You can try. I had someone in my life. I took classes because I was like, I'll take responsibility. It has to be me. I have to be part of this problem. Took classes, did therapy, tried to take this person to lunch, whatever I could do. And I'm pretty good at what I do. And I just could not get this person to, to be on the same page with me. And I just had to give up. It was just like, I just can't change who this person is. I can't fix that person. It's not my job to fix that person. And I just need to move on with the rest of my life. So you can't, everyone's not going to like you and everyone's not going to be there to support you. And sometimes you just have to say, get over it, move on. So speaking of moving on, um, we have reached our time, even though I know that there's so much more for us to discuss. And I wanna remind all of our attendees here today that this is just the beginning. Um, we intend to have a series of conversations similar to this and hopefully taking deeper dives than we were able to do in our time together today. And we hope that you'll join us. Um, as a follow-up to this conversation, we will be launching our 2022 Gender in the Workplace, cult, uh, Culture in the Workplace um, survey. So um, you will get first dibs at it. I'll send it out to you first, and then we'll send it out public. And please share it with your networks. Even if someone's not in our chamber um, network, they work in New Jersey, we want to hear what's happening. And we want to see how we can use data to inform our strategies and our conversations and our next steps. Um, I also want to thank our panelists for just what you do every day, who you are as humans. Um, you are women's women. It's so wonderful to have you in our network and for you to share just even tiny tidbits of your experiences with those that were able to join us today, I think was a real gift and I'm so appreciative. And Anjali, you're always the rock star. To be able to co-host and moderate a conversation with you um, is just a privilege that I don't ever take for granted and I'm so thankful. And thank then, you for the privilege. Thank you. And then I would be remiss in my role at the chamber if I didn't say that this is, again, just the beginning of a series. There will be subsequent webinars. We are intending to have women-only networking events this year, so we hope that you'll attend those. We also invite you to join us at our business summit in Atlantic City, April 13th and 14th. Great opportunity to be in the room with some of the biggest hitters in New Jersey's business um, industries and a great opportunity to network and um, perhaps seek new opportunities. And then um, later this year, every two years, we have our Women in Innovation Awards. And so we hope that you'll join us at that event so that we can support women who are really turning the dial forward here in New Jersey. And so just thank you all so much. And thank you to my chamber colleagues for embarking upon these series of conversations with us. Um, it's a real op great opportunity to be here at the chamber and lead this work and have such a great supportive team, um, making sure that we're all working in the same direction. Anybody have any wonderful last parting words before we head out today? Great all weekend, right. thank, thank you. you.
Wonderful to see you all and love seeing women sporting women. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all so, so much. Be safe this weekend with the blizzard that's coming and take good care of yourselves. And we'll see you all very soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.